Hello everybody! Today's video is going to be on the Russian famine of 1921, sometimes called Povolskye famine, which just means a Volga river famine. It happened in the early Soviet Union. Matter of fact, it was so early that the Soviet Union wasn't a thing yet. There was only the Russian Soviet Federative Socialist Republic. It happened in the immediate aftermath of the First World War. And, of course, in 1921 the Russian Civil War was still going on. In total about 16 million people were affected by the famine in some way, which means there was tremendous suffering. In this video I will explain the historical context, that mostly means the Russian Civil War, followed by mentioning the theorized causes of the famine, then I will go into the extent of the famine, the international relief effort, and then I will ask myself, and you, the real question, which is whether this famine was the fault of socialism. And then you will subscribe so you can see the weekly in-depth videos on leftist political and historical topics. The 1921 famine is only one of three famines in all of history, which are commonly used to show that communism is bad because there is literally no food ever. The other two are of course the Great Chinese Famine during the Great Leap Forward, which I talked about at length in my China video, and the Holodomor that happened in the Soviet Union about a decade after the famine this video is about. So this video really is the last one dealing with common anti-communist arguments that say that communism causes famine. So that being said, let's go. The famine itself started in 1921 and lasted until the end of 1923. But this is the historical context section, so we will start a bit earlier. For example in 1914. That is when World War I started. If you want details there is a video on that already. Essentially Russia was a Tsarist empire with everyone being super poor. Most couldn't read and barely had to eat. Then Russia found itself at war with Germany and Austria. It proceeded to lose to the enemy very slowly. At the same time the people were going hungry. So they protested and the Tsar killed them all. So more protested until eventually they got the democratic parliament and the Tsar abdicated. This was the February revolution. After they failed to do the things they had promised they would do the people started protesting and a man named Vladimir Lenin, yes I know his birth name was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, I just used the name he went by and the name literally everyone calls him. Stop pretending to be smart by telling me to use an obscure name that causes pointless confusion. So anyways Lenin decided to take matters into his own hands or rather into the hands of his party. You see he was a communist but he didn't think Russian capitalism was developed enough to turn into a socialist country the way Marx predicted. So instead he improvised and created a form of socialism in which the state acts as a tool of the working class to develop the industry and then reach socialism in the future. Basically instead of workers rising up and abolishing the state, the communist party would take over the state and then educate the people, provide what they need and manage and develop the industry until they would take over the state and eventually reach communism. So Lenin did exactly that. He seized the state apparatus in the name of the revolution. Soviet propaganda depicted this as some heroic storming of key government agencies but in reality they just kind of said they are in charge walked into the government buildings and nobody in the city was willing to oppose them. So they sent a peace negotiation to the Germans, who by the way were still invading. They would give up huge amounts of lands in exchange for peace. And why would they do that? Well believe it or not, back then, just like today, there were a lot of people who had issues with communism. And these people happened to be the ones that have the best lives under capitalism capitalists and nobles for example. And it just so happens that because of corruption 
um, that the nobles were the ones leading the armies in the First World War. Of course, the Bolsheviks officially dissolved those armies. Guess how well that worked. So now there were armies which were hostile to the communist government all over the country. I wonder what's going to happen next. No, not really. The Soviets set up their own Red Army and they started fighting. The following section is on the Civil War, which is a complete mess. So I will try to keep it understandable, which unfortunately means leaving out some of the less relevant things. So, first of all, Russia lost Ukraine, the Baltic states and Poland to the Germans and Austrians in exchange for peace. Then Finland asked for independence. And because Lenin knew that they would start fighting if he said no, he decided to grant it in 1917. In the south of what was Russia at the time, there was the Caucasus. Russia wanted to keep that land because of all the oil. And the Ottoman Empire and later Turkey, along with the British, also wanted the land because of the oil. Oh, and also Germany decided to pop in as well. Eventually, after Germany and the Ottoman Empire lost the First World War, they removed their troops and the British retreated because after World War I, the public wouldn't support military operations halfway across the globe. Next issue was the Czechoslovak legions. Essentially, during the First World War, the Russian Empire recruited Czech and Slovak prisoners of war, who then stopped listening to anyone once the civil war started. They didn't like the communists, they didn't like the anti-communists, who by the way were called whites, and they did the obvious thing and um, stole the entire Russian imperial gold reserve and fucked off through Siberia. The Red Army at this point noticed that they had too few men. This was because it was an all-volunteer force. After being forced to take part in a world war for years, there were understandably few people who wanted to sign up to more death and distraction. So the Soviets did the obvious thing and started conscripting people. This caused multiple issues. For one, it made them less popular. It caused the troops to be less socialist because now everyone was in them and they had too few officers to lead this new larger army. This solved the unpopularity problem by cracking down on dissent hard. They solved the disloyalty problem by sending political officers to every single regiment. And these political officers could punish whoever they wanted to based on whatever they decided was counter-revolutionary. These political officers would stay a feature in the Red Army until it was dissolved in 1991. And they solved the problem of having too few officers by conscripting imperial officers. Which is questionable at best, but it worked, so hey. At the end of 1918, the remnants of the imperial government officially formed the Provisional All-Russian Government. Basically the opposite of the communists. They had troops in the east of European Russia, in Siberia, in the Urals, some in Ukraine, which still officially belonged to Germany at the time, and they took regions around the Volga and Central Asia. Then they cooed themselves, because why not, and they continued to fight. You would think that the Soviets are lost, because they were encircled from all sides, but the opposite was true. The Soviets held the industry and population centers. The whites held mostly farm and wasteland. The Red Army overthrew the white government in Turkmenistan and then the US, UK, France and Japan decided that they can't have the communists win, so they sent in troops to help the whites. Basically, that failed to work and the Soviets advanced anyways. Then a white commander took the Northwestern Army of Imperial Russia which was stationed in Estonia and decided to take the capital, Petrograd. They managed to push into the outskirts of the city and then Trotsky decided to stop them. He did this by arming all workers, yes, even the women, and getting reinforcements from Moscow. Within a week, the defensive army had tripled in size and they defeated the whites. They would keep fighting in that region for another two years until eventually the whites surrendered. No, wait, I misspoke. I meant they moved to Estonia and agreed not to take Russia anymore. 
By 1919, the Soviets were prepared to advance on the Whites. Basically, they pushed east and eventually the White armies dissolved because everyone capitulated or deserted. This was the end of the main civil war, that being the one between the Whites and the Reds, but there were still many other regions that were unwilling to be a part of communist Russia. For example, in Ukraine, there was a region called Magnovia, which said that it was anarchist, but then did all the things anarchists suppose, like forming a state and conscripting peoples into the army. Eventually the Soviets um, killed them all. Then there was the Green Army, who were a coalition of loosely organized peasants militias. They hated the Soviets, they hated the Whites, they hated foreign invasions. Their entire goal was to prevent Whites and Reds from taking their grain or conscripting their people. Amazingly, this worked. As for most of the Civil War, neither side really touched them. But of course, after the Civil War, the Soviets invaded and took over the region. The last region we will get into was Poland. As you remember, the Soviets gave up Poland to Germany and returned for peace. But when Germany surrendered, it also had to give up Poland. So suddenly that land that was Russia five years ago was ruled by a small new government. So they decided to conquer Poland or liberate, I guess, depending on how much you like the Soviets. TLDR, they lost and agreed to leave Poland alone, at least until World War II, but that's far out of the scope of this video. Then there was a sailors rebellion in Kronstadt and Trotsky killed them all. As you can see, the Soviets were extremely willing to crush anyone in their way. They of course justified this by saying that they are the good guys and therefore people opposing them are the bad guys. So that was enough military history for one video I would say. Let's return to the famine. So now comes economics and politics. During the world war about two and a half million people died and in the civil war another 10 million. That is out of a population of 160 million. That's a casualty rate of 13% of the population. That is huge. And of course, during the war, the armies needed food. The Bolsheviks and the whites and even the anarchists had that much in common. And how do you get food? Well, from farmers, of course. So all participants in the civil war took grain from farmers, often with very little or no compensation. I would love to be able to say that the Soviets were better and didn't forcefully take grain without compensation, but they totally did. The only thing I can give them credit for is that the Bolsheviks and the anarchists never took more grain than the farmers could spare. Now, if you're a farmer and the government takes away all grain you don't need to feed yourself, what do you do? Exactly, you produce less grain because they will take away the surplus anyway so you can save yourself the effort. Or alternatively, you hide the grain somewhere and sell it on the black market later. So there was way less grain production which led to the armies lacking food. And when they heard that some peasants, which were definitely in the minority, were hiding grain, they used this as an excuse to take more grain than the peasants could spare. This was of course all participants in the war. The rail network in Russia was of course completely destroyed by the war and the state was kinda out of money after uh, the Czechoslovaks left the country with all the gold. The rail network stopped the government from sending grain to areas with shortages and the fact that there were food shortages on the whole planet prevented them from buying it from the open market. Of course, it didn't help that at the exact same time there was a famine in Poland and starvation in pretty much all of Europe. Turns out famines aren't always the fault of the government, but maybe a result of war and droughts. 23 nations were experiencing starvation deaths in the years after World War I. This included all republics formed from the Austrian and Ottoman empires, along with Germany, the UK and France. The causes of these famines were different, but in general it was because 
The soldiers who fought in the war for so many years were mostly farmers. And when they died, they couldn't farm anymore. A natural drought didn't help things. And of course, since we are in 1919, there was another major issue. Can you think of what it may be? The 1919 flu pandemic. 50 million people across the globe died and hundreds of millions were ill. So they couldn't produce food anymore. So more died. So basically the Russian famine wasn't a thing purely in Russia. It was rather the result of a global war, a natural famine and a great pandemic. Of course the civil war definitely didn't help. But then again, Russia wasn't the only war with the civil war style uprisings. I could elaborate, but I said no more military history. So if you're interested, just check out the aftermath of World War I Wikipedia page. So the question is, how large was this famine? Well, sources disagree on this. What people can agree on is that the famine was nothing new to the Russian people. Russia is huge and was barely industrialized. So most farmers, or even worse, serfs, had to manually harvest their crops using literal sickles, which would take days or weeks. And all it takes is one day too many of rain and all the grain is rotten. In the Russian Empire, there were famines and food shortages about twice a decade, which sounds horrifying to us nowadays, because it is. The thing that would finally end the cycle of famines would be industrialization. Farm equipment that could harvest whole fields in a day. Irrigation systems that made the fields no longer depending on getting the exact right amount of rain and sun. And rapid transportation systems to supply regions without harvest. Modern machinery is what brought us the standards of living and food security we have in the West right now. But of course, we're in 1921. The Soviet industrialization wouldn't really be on a notable level before the mid 30s. So naturally in 1921, all these things went wrong. There was a huge drought in the Samara district, which was one of the most affected ones. They had less than 1% of the usual rain amounts. That means instead of the regular 38 millimeters a year, they got 0.3 in 1921. Naturally, in this region, there was almost a complete crop failure. Plants just won't grow without water. That's biology. And the Tsar was too busy playing general to build irrigation systems before the war. The worst affected regions of all were the Volga River region, which is here. You see, this is the Volga and this is the region around it. Pretty self-explanatory. Ukraine was also affected, which was an issue because Ukraine produced one third of the grain in the country. This means huge amounts of people in non-agricultural regions depended on their grain. In total, about a quarter of all grain in the entire country failed before being harvested. Naturally, with their harvest failing, the peasants would return to the government grain stores, but they were empty. Because there was a war raging for years and then the civil war, both of which conscripted farmers. So the yield was low every year. And by 1921, there was simply nothing left. The farmers, of course, didn't have much left to eat. That is, of course, besides the seed grain that they were supposed to use to grow the next year's crops. But in their desperation, they ate it instead, which unfortunately meant that the famine would last two more years as they had no more seed grain. You can try to blame them for this, but really it was that or starving to death next to perfectly good grain. And like, I won't fault them for eating it. Other peasants decided to just abandon the farms altogether and move to city. Their goal was to get job in the factories and hopefully be able to buy food instead. Of course, Russia wasn't industrialized enough to provide work for them all. And the cities suffered from the famine just as much as the farmers had. There are reports from aid workers, and yes, we will get into the relief effort in a second, who say that they saw dozens of starved or 
starving people in the streets of Moscow and Kiev. This sounds a little hard to believe because I would think the government would pay someone to take the dead off the street, but who am I to question the legitimacy of one of the earliest reports about life in Soviet Russia made by the Americans? In total, about 16 million people experienced food shortages as part of the famine. That is 1 in 10 people in Russia. Almost everyone knew someone who was affected. And even worse, up to one third of these 16 million died of starvation in the three years of the famine. Of course, the fact that there was a huge drought all over Europe and starvation everywhere, including Russia, was hard to miss. And Lenin and his government were completely willing to admit that they had a great famine and a great threat of life. So he held a speech pleading for the peoples of the world to help save Russian lives. So nations offered aid. Specifically, the US offered aid. America was sending food to aid Europe since the Great War began in 1914. They specifically founded the American Relief Administration for this task. Originally, they spent their time feeding the displaced people on the Western Front. But as starvation was increasing, they gave to more people. Their policy was to not feed soldiers, but to feed civilians in need. They weren't a part of the war. They were a humanitarian organization. They were created by the US Congress with a budget of $1.5 billion in today's money. They provided aid all throughout Europe for the duration of the war and supported the newly independent nations as well, at which point they provided food for Polish soldiers fighting against the Russians. So those ideas didn't survive for very long. Matter of fact, they knew that some regions in Russia had food shortages during the Civil War. So even before the famine of 1921, and they actually offered aid to the Soviet government in 1919, but they declined. Why was that? Well, the American Relief Administration demanded Russia hand over control of 100% of its rail network to the ARA so they could distribute food. But since railroads are an extremely important part of modern warfare, and they were still in that civil war, Russia opted against handing it over. Not to mention, at the same time this American government agency was offering to take over the Russian rail network, the American government had 50,000 American soldiers invade the northern coast to fight the Bolsheviks. So naturally they didn't want to trust the American government, which makes sense considering they were de facto at war with them. Of course, by 1921, the Americans left Russia and all other factions of the civil war were destroyed. So naturally, when Lenin pleaded to other nations to give them support, the American Relief Administration offered support again. And of course, this time Lenin eagerly accepted the aid. The American agency assumed they would feed about 1 million people in Russia, mostly children. But of course, when they were there, they couldn't just let the adults starve. So within a short time, they were feeding 10 times that many every day. In total, the organization employed 130,000 Russians to help distribute the food and they negotiated with the Russian government, so they got complete authority on the distribution of the food. This was to make sure that the Soviet government wouldn't treat some regions, uh, religions or races better than others. The ARA got its funding from all over the place. Some from the US Army, some from the US Congress, some they got from the Soviet government, which by this time had money, just not food, and of course, large parts of it came from individual donations from the Western world. Interestingly, over time, a new problem emerged. There was no coal or oil. Because, of course, the Russian coal mines suffered from an acute case of uh, their workers starving. This means the Russian winter was about to start and millions of people had no sources of heat. So the ARA decided to also provide warm clothing to people. It's really rare to see the American government intervening in another country being a good thing, but they literally did all good in this case. Eventually, over the years of 1922 and 1923, the famine effects would get smaller 
and fewer people relied on the ARA for food. Eventually, in 1923, the Soviet government started exporting grain again to be able to afford industrialization. So, the American government decided that if they are selling grain on the free market, they can provide grain for the hungry. So, they stopped operations. From what I can gather, the takeover of the Soviet government to feed the hungry went seamlessly and nobody died because of it. So the Americans didn't just leave people to starve, they coordinated with the Soviet government on this. Of course, Russia would then industrialize and eventually famines would be a thing of the past. And that was the story of the 1921 Russian famine. So there is only one question left. Can we somehow blame this on evil communism? Well, I think after I laid out the facts, the answer is pretty obvious. It wasn't the fault of the government. Russia was completely used to famines at this time, and it was just unfortunately that the war strained the grain reserves. Someone may try to blame the Soviets for the civil war, but you can blame the other communists just as well. Of course, during the civil war, neither side was really respecting the peasants at all, but they still left them enough food to survive. Well, until the armies went hungry, that was. But of course, the famine was in large part after the civil war. So we can doubt if the grain requisition was even a major factor at all. There will be people trying to say that the cause of the famine was the government mismanaging the economy or the result of some Soviet industrialization plan. I'm sorry to disappoint, but the policies of Lenin weren't related to the causes of the famine. And as a matter of fact, Lenin's new economic policies only started after the famine. So blaming it is quite a stretch. Of course, the truth is that there was always hunger in Russia. A driving force behind the protests that caused the Tsar to abdicate was that the peasants were hungry. And of course, all over Europe, people went hungry after World War I. This was caused by both the effects of the wars that devastated entire economies and due to a complete drought which nobody could have foreseen. Matter of fact, the famine was worse in Poland than in Russia. They had even less to eat, but they got international aid before they ate their seed grains so the famine ended faster. As I mentioned, a quarter of all crops just died before being harvested. Not because of evil Lenin collectivizing or anything. Which, by the way, would also only happen later. Matter of fact, I'd argue that the communist government significantly reduced the scope of the famine. By the summer of 1921, they asked the world for aid. This was before the harvest came in. They asked for aid because they heard that there may be a failed harvest. Many lesser governments would have denied that there is an issue until the grain reports came in, or just pretended there is no issue to save face. Cough! Chinese famine, cough, a lot more, cough. I think Lenin did the best thing he could have done in his position. You can of course make the point that he should have already accepted aid in 1919 during the civil war, but I sort of get why he was hesitant to let the foreign government agency take complete control of a vital war winning infrastructure in the middle of a civil war. So in conclusion, no, communism is not the cause of the famine. There were no socialist policies causing the crop loss and the Soviet government took immediate action to prevent all the suffering they could. If you want to blame communist government structures for a famine, look at my video on China, specifically the Great Famine section. All that being said, I have nothing else to say. Thanks for watching, subscribe and such, and be aware that I'm starting university next week which mean I will no longer be doing YouTube full time, but only part time. This may cause shorter or fewer videos in the future, so be warned. I would like to thank all of my Patreons, because now that I'm moving out of my parents' house, I actually need money for food, so it's nice to have your support. And I would like to especially thank Darius the Bird, Eric Betts, Harris Hawk, Hugo Castellanos, Zander Corvus, Carissa, Daniel Hyman, Dominic Curaselli, Emily Marigold Classen, Gabi Gita, Herdina, Josh C, Klaastrup, Lilith Craft, Mamuka Tsikaluri, 
are Marxism Tonight, Nana Ephema, Nora Quinn, Poet, Raman Deville, Red Shock Trooper, Sean Murphy, Skylar, Skylar Magnum Turner, Stairmaster Chef and Trey.